Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Brie to like musical theater. And today, we've got an extra special returning guest. Ooh, a very, very special extra returning guest. Yes, yes, our period drama pal. It is um, <laughs> streamer, writer, comedian, content creator, Kate Robinson of the Movie Chick on YouTube and Twitch. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! Hi, everyone. It's really good to be it's back. It's been a... <laughs> It's been a while. How have you been? I've been doing good. Just super busy. <laughs> I, I, I completely understand that. I mean, I've been busy myself, mm. too. Um, oh, so what have you, you been see, up to? What had happened was um, I got married once, um, and then I locked her in like a little area of my house. And then <laughs> I tried to... As you do. <laughs> as you do. Because she, she, she crazy. Oh, of um, course. So crazy. <laughs> and then I try to get married again, but then I, I was just really using that one to try to make my governess jealous. So that marriage is canceled. I marry Don't. my governess. And then on my wedding day, someone shows up and is like, well, you're married already. And I'm like, oh, everybody, look, my crazy wife in the attic. <laughs> and then that governess <laughs> runs away. And then uh. that, she tries to burn down my house. I go blind for a little bit. And then my governess comes back and everything is fine jeez another october huh yeah it was crazy that's what's <laughs> happened since you've been gone andrew it's been a really wild life yeah i mean i understand <laughs> i've been dealing with my own you know wife in the attic kind of situation <laughs> kate how's your wife in the attic <laughs> oh you know she set my house on fire it's been a crazy tuesday <laughs> i know it's wednesday now but you know <laughs> that's how it feels just normal yeah. normal guy things oh, yeah. you know normal yeah, normal yeah. people just dudes being dudes guys <laughs> being guys. <laughs> on that note this week we're talking about jane Eyre the musical cue the music break <laughs> damn the passion damn the skies damn the light that's in her eyes i know well what it has been before she saves me but i can't be saved Frees me, but I'm still in his Now I battle I what I most adore. Oh, let me sail away. Get lost and see for I won't care. So Jane Eyre is a musical with music by Paul Gordon and lyrics by Paul Gordon and a book by John Carrad, based on Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. It opened at the Brook, Brooks Atkinson Theater on December 10, 2000 and closed in June 10, 2001 after 36 previews and 209 performances. Marla Schaffel, who plays the title character, won a Drama Desk Award and the Outer Critics Circle Award. It was nominated for very few Tonys and didn't win any. The plot is, an orphaned English girl takes a governess job at the home of the mysterious Rochester, learning secrets about him as she falls in love with him. In this musical adaptation of the Charlotte Bronte novel, they, they, they did the bare minimum there. <laughs> All right. So, Kate, what is your history with the Jane Eyre book, and what did you think of the musical in general? So, I love this book. I've seen about <laughs> seven other adaptations. Uh, I grew up reading the book, uh, I would say, mm, probably when I was 14 is when I first read it. Uh, it's probably my favorite Bronte novel overall amongst the three mm -hmm. sisters. So I went into this musical with high, high expectations. Like I know what will be missing, what's been added, what's been changed, mm -hmm. which I do have, an, I have some notes <laughs> of things that I noticed like, huh, that was a little different. <laughs> hmm. Yes. And I'm curious about that because I know this musical very well and I know the book very well. And I like most of the changes and adaptation things that work on stage that have never worked in a film adaptation work here better mm -hmm. than they ever have. And I'm sure we'll get into that. Whereas Andrew here has never heard, never heard the story, never knew anything, walked into this <laughs> blind. I didn't know what I was getting into. Mm. Um I had to watch it twice because honestly, I got a little bit confused the first time. But the second time, I think I understood everything that happened. So, um, Kate, if you won't mind, can I force Andrew to describe the plot for us oh, real quick? I can't wait Lord. to hear this. I'm excited. <laughs> okay, um, I will do my very best. Uh, Jane Jane Eyre is like a, an orphan girl that lives at some like school for like nuns or something. I, I honestly couldn't quite <laughs> figure out what that was supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> Um, school for girls yeah. <laughs> and like her her aunt hates her and tells her that she hates her and she hates her back and you know it's a good relationship you know everyone's <laughs> happy um 
she has like a friend. I can't remember who the friend is. What Helen? the friend's name yeah. was? Helen. Okay. Yeah. And then the friend dies, and that's it. You know that sucks. And eventually, <laughs> <laughs> eventually Jane's like, I gotta leave this fucking school. Like this place sucks ass. Mm. And she's like, Bye. Um. <laughs> and she just goes off and becomes like a what do they call her? A governess, yeah. which is like yes. a nanny of sorts. That's what Jess it's like tells a me. A live-in tutor. <laughs> yeah. A live-in tutor. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. To the uh, the Rochester family, the Rochester it's Rochester Thornfield is Hall, Ward. I think is what it's called. Thornfield yeah. Hall. It's what he. Uh, but yeah, his name is Rochester. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's is it it's his kid, right, or is it not? In theory, in theory, yeah. They don't. They kind of gloss over it in the musical. <laughs> The kid like disappears eventually and like never comes back to the show. Except to sit awkwardly on Jane Eyre's lap as they scream into her ear their romantic song <laughs> to each other. I yeah. will never that, was, lose <laughs> that was the only really awkward shot for me. This poor kid just kind of like sitting there smiling awkwardly as they're screaming in her ear. So I'm like, someone let it's that like, poor child down. <laughs> yeah, the kid. When we get the kid off stage, they don't have to be here. <laughs> um, but uh, she like starts like falling in love with this guy but all this weird stuff keeps happening like his bed gets lit on fire and like i, I I'm trying to remember what else there was like um they introduced blanche ingram <laughs> yeah blanche and that's the um is that the woman that he's trying to marry i'm sorry yes. i'm not good with names but i'm pretty sure more like she wants to marry him because he's wealthy yeah <laughs> Yeah, and, he's and, and using he, her. he is using her to make Jane jealous, which is mm -hmm. just bizarre. Just very strange to me. But that, that happens, and then there's, like, um a part where there's, like, everyone goes to bed, and there's, like, screaming in the house, and, <laughs> like, all of this wacky, wild stuff. Um, And then eventually... uh. Jeez, there's the freaking scene with with the uh the the racial slur that I'm not sure I should say on the show the here. The G slur for <laughs> Romani people. Yeah, which um, is cut out of a lot of versions. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I'm I'm gonna avoid saying that, although it's gonna be kind of hard since the name of the song is <laughs> <laughs> the G slur for Romani people. Yes. Um. So that happens, and and um the Rochester guy dresses up as that, kicks out. The other girls are scares the girl away and then tells Jane to stay. Um, and then they're going to get married. But then before that can happen, somebody's <laughs> like, wait, no, don't do that. Because actually his wife is still alive. <laughs> she lives in the attic. <laughs> and then Jane's like, all right, fuck this. I'm gone. Oh, Bye. Um, and I think I'm pretty sure that's what happened. <laughs> And then the aunt from earlier that hated her dies, and Jane's like, we should forgive each other. And the aunt's like, nah. Um, but here's I think, a bunch of money. Yeah, the, the, then she gets a bunch of money from the uncle. And then she goes back to the Rochester because um, you're the skipping house gets the burnt Protestant down. Um, uh, missionary her cousin. fella coming in. <laughs> oh, I yeah. don't even remember that part. What, Freak, what happened? Cue the, there's a man that knows how to marry his cousin clip. <laughs> no! This is a man that knows how to marry his cousin. I don't even remember this part. What happened there? He's barely um, in the musical, which... I think he, if he's there, he gets like one song. Yeah, yeah. it's about a missionary <laughs> life, but it's interrupted by um, Rochester saying Jane over and over. Yep. <laughs> oh, so, uh, okay. Um, then the Rochester house gets burnt down by the wife, but she jumps off the roof and dies. So now I guess it's okay for the Jane and Rochester to get married because the but wife's dead now. Rochester's blind. <laughs> yeah. If this all of this part is like a blur. It kind of all goes together. Yeah. All right. How did he do, Kate? He honestly, considering that I feel so bad that this is your first adaptation because it cuts out a lot in the second half of the book. <laughs> so yes. the fact that you even There's caught like, on it to flies. Things, the second half like flies it by. It does. I had to. I discussed this a lot with my with my girlfriend as well, who has read the book, mm -hmm. and I was trying to figure out because honestly, I a lot of like the him being blind, I don't really remember. The part with the cousin, they I don't really remember. They like 900 times. Like... Yeah, but I don't remember it actually happening. <laughs> no, yeah. I don't know. Um, and the... Yeah, it, it just... <laughs> it, it, it likes to jump around to a lot of different stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Although the first act kind of drags because it's like they they just kind of sit in the freaking house for a long time and nothing happens. <laughs> All right, Kate, I'm so interested in what you think of the changes because I'm going to lay my cards out here. I love this musical a lot for a lot of dumb reasons where I think I just like the album and then fill the pieces in with what I know from the book and the other mm-hmm. adaptations. Like I'd like to say I don't even think it's that bad. I think the music is really good. It's just it was very yeah. hard for me to follow it yeah. on the first watch. Oh, <laughs> Even coming from someone who read the book, the beginning, uh, the beginning um, was a little hard to follow for two reasons. Um, I didn't realize little Jane wasn't going to sing. It's going to be older Jane, who we, you know, I haven't really gotten to know in that version yet. So she's sort of narrating her life in the beginning. And that confused me a little bit because I was like, who's this woman that's looming over this child? <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, that oh, was a bit Jane. strange. <laughs> Uh, Which I guess on one hand is a way to keep Bronte's actual words because it is told in first yeah. person without having... I get it, but yeah. I agree. It was a little hard, hard to follow at first. Then I didn't realize who Helen was because she's not played by a child. She's played by a grown-ass woman. And yeah. I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> and I thought... I thought it yeah. was like one of her teachers Me or too. something. Me I thought I'm like, why is her teacher <laughs> saying all these lines that Helen was saying? I'm like, oh, that's Helen. <laughs> Can only afford one child actress. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought that was a shame because the character of Helen is inspired by Charlotte Bronte's real oh, older sister who mm. they were sent to a real school like this. And her older sister had died very much in the same fashion as Helen. They were not taken care of very well. It was very easy to get sick and die. Um, and that's what happened to her older sister. And that's who Helen is based off of. So Helen's sort of like this perfect caricature version of this sister she never really got to know. So I thought it was like a bit of a missed opportunity, but I, I understood, you know, they didn't want to... There were some powerful vocals they really needed to come out of for Helen, especially her her final song that she sings, you know, when she gets laid to rest. Yeah. But it was confusing to follow at first. <laughs> Um, I did love the uh, the characterization of the school. It was like very, they lightened the cruelty just a little bit because the beginning of the book is very heavy. I mean, the whole book is heavy, mm. but like, it's not funny with the abuse she endures in the school. So the fact that they were able to inject some humor just so you're not depressed the entire time, I thought was actually a, a good change. It was like, okay, good, because you don't want to bum everyone out yeah. before you even got into the third song. Right right at the very start. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, other than that, it, the first half of the musical follows the book pretty faithfully. I, I'm okay with certain changes. I like the mixture of quotes into the music. That is yeah. where I think like mm-hmm. this show stands above. Most other adaptations, mm-hmm. I feel like they turn it into poetry, but it's still very much the intentionality of the lines, which are yes. incredible. Well, and I think what helps is the way Charlotte Bronte, especially she writes the uh, Jane's voice, is very this gothy poetic you know purple prose so it's easy to kind of put it into songs which i thought really worked the first instance where i was like oh i don't think this change is going where i like it is the entire ant character they there's a huge 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 change that they do so she doesn't happen upon her aunt her aunt dying sends word for her and wants to make amends before she dies because she was right. horribly abusive and she wants to cop to it. And Jane doesn't really want to go, but she's like, you know what, though? We need to forgive each other. Let me just be the bigger person and go there. And this is during when her and Rochester were really bonding, which I think they kind of pare down a little bit, too. Um, and she leaves during when, like, Blanche Ingram and the rest are all hanging out there. So, mm-hmm. like, they don't just hang out for a party. They're there for, like, a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he eventually tells them all to go home because the whole reason why they're there is to make Jane jealous. And now she's off back to her hometown. So she's not going to, you know, it's not going to work on her anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm OK with them cutting down on the cousin character. There were a few other cousins we didn't get to meet who were way nicer. He's just very, <sighs> I think what Charlotte Bronte was trying to characterize with him is he's, he's the perfect godly man where he's just very stoic he knows what he wants he's very responsible but like the whole reason why to get wants to get married to Jane Eyre which they made a little bit more impassioned in the musical is that he's like no it just makes sense you know you're a sensible woman I'm a sensible guy who cares if we're cousins it's fine back in the like 1800s (laughs) you know there's a man who knows how to marry his cousin (laughs) exactly so I was fine with them paring down his character his character's not that interesting (laughs) 
Uh, but the money she inherits is actually her uncle, who we only hear mm-hmm. mentioned like twice. <laughs> Um, and he, the uncle is actually one of the main reasons why they, she couldn't get married to Rochester because he is told, I think by Mason, the, the wife in the attic's brother who got attacked during the party. (laughs) Yeah. Um, he, lots of threads. Yeah. Basically it all kind of came together. And once the uncle realized Jane was alive, he's like, oh my God, she cannot, you know, commit this sin. She can't get married to a married man. You know, it's not possible. So that's one of the people who ratted out rochester and yeah they kind of pare down why he his wife is up in the attic it's more alluded to <laughs> i mean it's, he just likes keeping her in the yeah, attic it's one of the <laughs> aged poorly bits of the book of the whole reason why she's up in the attic but it also kind of spoke to we didn't really treat people very well who had any sort of mental health yeah. issues <laughs> So. Which is why the musical kind of like glances over yeah. that a bit. <laughs> Although it kind of makes it a little weirder because it's like, yes. wait, why did you lock your wife in the attic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, I think are you this... sure you should go through with this? Are you going to be in the attic? <laughs> I think where this musical <laughs> excels, where a lot of the plot elements are missing, it makes up for in the small character moments it expands upon mm-hmm. very well. Um, like, I don't think I've ever felt the real romance and sexual tension between Jane and Rochester in any adaptation, and I feel it very hardcore here. I feel like a lot of the things that are now musicalized are very effective in doing so. You're getting and a sexual also, romance from it now. Yeah. Um, and also there's like little moments that are in the book that are rarely interpreted and would be very difficult to interpret into a film adaptation, like the portrait painting sequence, which is rarely adapted and is so perfectly adapted because you get to get inside her head and her explaining why she's doing it instead of just a thing that she's doing. Mm -hmm. So I really love that scene. And the proposal scene, my God, that entire song is incredible and it's very accurate to how it's portrayed. And a lot of adaptations tend to just be like, oh, thunderstorm, get it out of the, make it her very cryy and all that. Where this is like, no, no, you, I would understand why Jane agrees like, okay, yeah, I'll marry you after how impassioned he is singing in a way where if it doesn't feel like a manipulation in the way that it tends to feel in the film adaptation. I agree that I like the song that in the way that they took like one of my favorite lines, the um, he feels that they are faded with the string on their rib cage yes. and that if they were any farther apart it would snap. I love that they added that in song. I was like, oh yeah, that's a great line to do. This is not my favorite proposal scene. Um, of Which one is? Uh, from the 2006 miniseries with Ruth Wilson yes. and uh, Toby Stevens. I thought mm-hmm. if I had to pick who was the couple of the adaptations I've seen who has the best chemistry, it's that 2006 one. Also because I thought Ruth Wilson is just my favorite Jane Eyre and she just nails the character for me personally. I, I agree. I like this actress who plays Jane. She's sometimes a little, this is going to sound weird, she sometimes is a little too animated for who Jane is because, and I get it because she has to just to express to you all the emotion she's actually feeling inside because the whole crux of her character is that she has she's been taught to keep everything in her head she cannot express yes. herself so i get so when she would do it through song i was i like get it I'm like okay i'm in her head i get why she's impassioned but when she would talk to people a certain way i was like uh i don't know if i'm following her performance here but i love the rochester uh the actor for the rochester he was great <laughs> Let's put a pause right yeah. there for a second. Time, elephant in the room. Let's pause right here. Um, hey, this is the fourth time I've had to give the speech. James Barber played Rochester uh, in Jane Eyre. He is a convicted pedophile. He coerced a woman to p- perform sexual acts on him while he was playing in this performance. He is a piece of shit. He went to jail for it. And then the Broadway community welcomed him back with open arms. Fuck him. All right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow, that's heavy. Um, I did yeah, not know. I, I know it, it's unfair. Um, I didn't. Want, I that is the elephant that needed to be addressed. Um, that is like the big controversy with the show. It did not come out until oh. probably ten years after it happened. But very bad man. That's a shame. That's a waste of talent. It is because he was so good person. in this. Yeah, that that's a real waste of talent. Wow. Yeah, I didn't mean to bring it down because I agree with you. I think his performance is very good. But don't confuse that with me saying, oh, he's so good. Why isn't he on Broadway anymore? <laughs> oh, no, no. Totally Why did he go anyways? I think we know why he's not. Yeah. Yeah. Very bad person. Um, yeah. Um, so don't confuse us praising 
the elements in the show and the way that that character is written for praising the man. No fair. I, I love the characterization of Rochester in this show a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I also just tend to feel like he's tending to play in a lot of adaptations a little more cold where this one tends to play him a little bit cocky and funny. Yeah, it's very much like the 2006 uh, miniseries where he's a bit I more agree. mischievous. There's like a playfulness to him. Um, yeah, I, I'm not fond of like a... Ooh, like a, a lot of the early old adaptations, like the 43 with Orson Welles, where he's just this grumpy jerk the entire movie. <laughs> yes, but then there's some moments where he'll just crack a joke, and I'm like, there it yeah. is. <laughs> I mean, there, there are some moments where it peeks through a bit. Um, I think Timothy Dalton's not great when he does it. <laughs> Timothy Dalton kind of feels like he's in a completely different like movie. Like, he's right. in like, a different story altogether. <laughs> um, but it brings... Your point that you brought up um, actually comes back to a feeling I have about the book in general and most movies. It feels like Child Jane and Adult Jane are two different characters. Like, Little Jane is like this very snarky, like, what happens when you die? Or if you're a liar and you die, you go to hell. Then what are you going to do? I guess I got to stay healthy then. Like, (laughs) I feel like you lose. That's a great line, by the way. It is a great (laughs) line. But she is not that way when she grows up. And I really like that they kind of keep a little bit of her snarkiness in this interaction interpretation which i feel like is an intentional choice by the the writers here um and i've felt that here where i tend to feel like especially mia waskasawa oh god uh, mia waskasawa yeah i don't like her performance in that i know what you're talking about the 2011 one she's very weepy in there yeah she, but honestly, that's most of her performances in film. I've seen her in so many films, and she's always that, the very sad English rose, you know, who pouts. With the exception of Only Lovers Left Alive, where I yeah. feel like that's her most alive performance just because everyone else is so dead in that movie. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's one of the things I really like about that. It, and yeah, it's not accurate to the book, but I feel like that's always been a big problem with me in the book and film adaptations is Child Jane is like such a s- smart as a whip, yeah. like really like quick witted and all that. And then she grows up and she's like, yes, I will do anything that the master says, Master Rochester <laughs> and all that. And she like, oh, I will take care of Adele and all. She becomes much more mousy in a way that I don't particularly like. Yeah. No, and that makes And that's why she wrote it the way she yeah. did, where it's like a woman finding her voice. Because when she... Through a man. They, they cut it out of the musical because it wasn't really a necessary scene, but there's a really mm. cute moment after the proposal scene. He's just like, okay, well, I'm going to do full-on PDA. And she's like, nope. In fact, I'm still going to call you <laughs> Mr. Rochester and you can't touch me until the, until the wedding. And it was all her decision. Like, she controlled mm. the relationship, more or less. I mean, she's the one who breaks up with him, which you see once she discovers there's a woman hiding in the attic. <laughs> So. You can't can't really stay in that relationship. No. <laughs> um, Honestly, probably more should do more than break up with him at that point. Probably go no contacts. But, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of no not yeah. answering those texts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you had a you had a woman in your attic. That's right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the luck. <laughs> Uh, I wish they actually developed more of the breakup scene because there was a one unintentionally funny moment where she's just kind of telling him to be strong and I have to leave you. And then she just runs, (laughs) which made it a little unintentionally funny because then he has like his whole like it sounds like a villain song almost where he's like tearing the house apart looking for her. Yes. (laughs) I was like, let's let's talk about that moment for a second. Um. That is probably my favorite song in the show, despite everything you say is well, wrong with the it. The segue um, into it was a little weird. It was a little jarring yes. for me. But I was talking to the composer a mm. couple years ago, um, but he said that he's re- recontextualizing and rewriting the show for a future um, Pro Shot release, and he's cutting that song because he thought it felt misplaced. And you can hear me in the recording like, what? No, why? <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe you'll convince maybe you convinced him i don't think so i don't i i really don't but we'll i was like to see if it shows I up i feel like the show doesn't work without it because that's rochester's a big moment in my opinion and i feel like if you lose that you kind of lose a lot of energy that is built up in that second half because mm-hmm. it goes fast and that is kind of your payoff for all the fast moment is that big long and to live here on earth without my jane 
Oh, yeah. Um, I would agree with that. I I mean, if they're going to take it out, I really wish they then would, would replace it with something because that's the big moment where he becomes broken. Like, he was yes. already on his way out from all the stuff that he's experienced. But once she leaves, and because at first, like, that whole breakup moment in the book, it starts off with, like, begging, then he's yelling, and then it just ends with him on the floor crying. You know, like, he's just, please, you can't leave. But she has to leave for her own sake like you know it's she's in the relationship too so i like the the song it's just more it her running out the room like a looney tune character was a little <laughs> <laughs> i think there there should they should have done it the way that it, it's in the book where she's essentially she tells him to be strong and she just walks out with her head up high i don't think she needed to run out the room in my i opinion. think she ran because that yeah. song's so short and she has a costume change <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> if you want me to be honest <laughs> You know, that's probably an accurate, <laughs> accurate look. Because I'm like, man, that feels like a functional running, to be honest. And there's people there like, all right, get that off, get that off. And we're going to jump back on. All right. One more thing before we move into previews. Um, how many blind references before going blind is too many? <laughs> like, because every other song, he makes some metaphor about going blind or leave me blind, or this and that. I'm like, how many of those is too many? Enough is never enough, Jess. Like, what? what is the, like, literally in that villain song we were talking about, Goodbye Fair Angel, which I still very much love, or, um, it's like, I, why do I have eyes to see you're not there, is one of those. <laughs> uh, <laughs> more, put in more. And in the proposal, it's like, and you will leave me blind. Um, and another one during Sirens where he's like, or I won't see her voice where I'll be wild and free or something like that. Where I'll be blind and free. That was it. Can you count how many there were? I did not count, but I know there's like a lot. There's at least five or six. <laughs> I don't remember okay. being that's just... that foreshadowed in the book either. <laughs> no, it's just a thing that happens. <laughs> it's, a thing, it's a temporary thing too, because he gets his eyesight back by the time they in have the, the first kid together. Epilogue. Yeah. <laughs> Like, he's like, oh, he can see his child. I mean, it's a little ableist, but whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's just because Bronte was a very religious person, so it was just like he finally repented for his sins. I mean, the whole reason he became blind is because he tried to go back in the house to save who he could. So it was more of like the exposure to the smoke and the you know brightness of the flames is what caused right. it. Do you, think he, do you think he tried to save his uh, wife that was in the attic? Yes, he did. Um, yes, he did. I, there, I think also Grace died in the fire as well because she was kind of trapped up in the attic because that's where she usually... Because Grace is one who's supposed to take care of the wife. But yes. Uh, they he did try to save her and that she just kind of looked at him and then went peace and then jumped off <laughs> the roof. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah yeah it's ridiculous. Um, there I think in other adaptations of this musical they've added a song explaining like that entire story where the um the guy that ratted them out comes over and he's like she jumped off the roof that poor lady poor lady um. Um, and another one that just popped into my head now that I'm just talking off the stream ahead is like help him gather sight where he is blind. Like there's so there's so many little <laughs> ones that are just thrown out there, <laughs> where it's like he's gonna go blind, guys. The guy, he's gonna gonna it's go. Gonna happen. Get are you ready. all excited? Are you all excited for it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but who cares what we think? We got to hear about what the New York Times said about this musical in good old 2001, right? Old 2000. 2000. No. 2000. They, December yeah. of 2000. So basically 2001. Yeah. It's time for previews. It's time for previews. All right. So this is a, re a review by Bruce Weber. Uh, he says, in Jane Eyre, Charlotte Bronte unleashed a full and independent female spirit on the repressive Victorian landscape. But from the moment that Miss Shaffle emerges from darkness to open the show with a nod to Bronte's polite first person, my story begins gentle audience a long age ago. The storytelling is fitful and hurried, a pace that accommodates a soundtrack but rarely pauses long enough for an actual song. Still, the design and lighting here are far from tepid, which is one of which is one word to apply to this score by Paul Gordon, whose work seems to be straight from the Broadway schmaltz kit of Andrew Wo Andrew Lloyd Webber and Claude Michael Schon Schoenberg. Mr. Gordon has written a lot of music for the show. Much of the dialogue is delivered in semi 
is it reset resuscitative resuscitative (laughs) but the songs are few the overall gallop through bronte's A significant plot has the teasing quality of a movie trailer. We barely see Bertha when she sneaks down from the attic to set Rochester's bed aflame. You can see why speed is essential. The show runs three hours even with its accelerator to the floor. Uh, But it is a failing that the directors have used the Bronte story for mere staged directions. The results... The result is that a great adult fable has been attenuated to the thinness of a children's story. All right. I think that's a little harsh. (laughs) Might be a little bit harsh, but I kind of see what the criticism that he's directing at is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they definitely trimmed stuff and some, some of the plot points are just like gone, you know, just fly by. And I like a lot of the ballads, but I feel like the stories, they stop a little bit as opposed to like accelerating the story the way that Les Mis so successfully uses music to accelerate a very, very long story. But I like the songs is the problem. Like, I, I don't disagree. There are songs in this show. They are also just recitative mixed in too. Yes. Um, I think overall it's agree with, but at a milder level. Yeah, I, I kind of meet them in the middle with, because I agree the biggest failing for me with the musical is the pacing there especially for the second half it, there's just too much missing so a lot of it falls flat um and the music is really really good and i think that's what helps carry it through to the end and i really did like how they handled the ending but it was mostly in the middle that it kind of got a little scrambled like the way they handled the ant the way they handled the reveal of bertha and so on and so forth and the fact that they mm. kind of dropped the uncle altogether apart from like a mention now that makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. But you know what? That's a trained theater critic for the New York Times. <laughs> and honestly, they, they have too Who much power. Who cares what they have to say? Literally, they, it's not like they have power over Broadway or anything and could close a show with a bad review. It, it, that would be ridiculous. What really matters is Letterbox and the insane yes. human beings <laughs> that spit their thoughts there. Um, it's time again for a preview segment. Um, five star, one star. Where we're going to read you guys some Letterbox reviews and you have to guess whether it's a five star review or a one star review just based on the review content These are- alone often very difficult so here we go (laughs) yes i will say these are from many versions of jane Eyre. it's not just one these are all the film versions because not a lot of people tend to review them um throughout time in memoriam so um kate i'm gonna be on your team so i'm gonna read questions for you and Bree's gonna read questions for andrew so (laughs) we're a team here i'm gonna try to make this work okay we got a list of reviews here um and we're gonna we're gonna go Bree, do you want to start this time i do okay all right. Um here's here's one Andrew. Good except for how ugly Rochester is. <laughs> wow. So good except for like a pretty important aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Remember it's important. Yeah. Well, Rochester's uh, ugly in the books. Yeah, the, he's usually hot in the adaptations. That's a weird choice that they always tend to make. Mm-hmm. All right. One that's a one. That's a one star. It's correct. <laughs> All right. Are you ready for this one, Kate? Yes. All right, this one is show Rochester and drag you absolute cowards. Um, wow, which adaptation was that? That was the 2006 adaptation oh, okay. because <laughs> of the 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 slur for Romani people was a woman and not um just Rochester doing an impression, which it is in the book. Mm-hmm. Oh, that could is that is that a one star? That is a one star. Okay. They sounded angry. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes sometimes they'll sound angry though and it's a five star it's like yeah <laughs> you can't trust these, these you can't people. trust them it's honestly it's, it's true, like a, you can't it's like a coin flip half the time all right andrew all right all right this is the horniest shit i have ever seen in my life five stars <laughs> five stars that is a five star. <laughs> no hesitation all right all right all right kate here we go jane Eyre eyebrow challenge <laughs> Oh my god. Is that it? That's the whole review. <laughs> Jane Eyre eyebrow challenge. Jane Eyre eyebrow. Is that a one star? That is a one star. <laughs> Ooh. And they're referring to Ruth Wilson's eyebrows. So mean. <laughs> I think she I looks... mean she does have intense she eyebrows does, in that movie. I think she looks like a like a cute little like duckling because her, her upper lip kind of sticks out. Yeah. I like her a lot. I think she's very, very good I, and underrated yeah. actress. I really, really like her a lot too. Alright, Brie! 
Okay, Andrew, if Charlotte Bronte isn't masturbating in her grave, it's not a faithful adaptation. I agree. Hard agree there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, five stars. Five stars. That was a one star. Oh, Ooh, Kate, we're taking this. Oh, jeez. Yes, Kate, you have. She has two points, correct? Yes. Jesse, okay. <laughs> um, all right, ready. Mm-hmm. Orson Welles, mad sexy in this. <laughs> Five stars. That is correct. <laughs> and oh, that now was an you easy have three one. points, Kate. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I mean, he was mad, sexy in that. He was very mad in it. I mean, that proposal scene is just great. Him just shaking. Uh, what's Jane? Jo- jo- you jo- love jo- me, right? Me. Say you'll marry me. <laughs> 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 no exaggeration. That's how it was done. Oh yeah. Oh my it's god. So- well, yeah, because they they kind of like had a skip just go from like the beginning to the end of the proposal so he literally like whips around and goes like you have to marry me and she's like okay and then thunder and lightning <laughs> yeah. is coming out boom shoom shoom yeah. <laughs> marry me jane get, get, let's get this going <laughs> i love that proposal scene for that yes. reason <laughs> it's really funny all right andrew okay I'm, I'm ready i'm ready i'm okay. ready Ha ha ha. Get it? Because he didn't see when she was in the attic and now he doesn't see at all. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Letterboxed. It's great. So they're either they either didn't like it and were being sarcastic there or they thought that that was actually very clever. I'm going to go with one star. I think that was a one star. No, Andrew, it was five. <laughs> How was that? A, that was sounded so negative. <laughs> All right, Kate, we got this. All right. All right. The only case of bigamy you'll ever root for. Um. <laughs> what? The, <laughs> the only case of bigamy you'll ever root for. Oh, God. Um. Uh, I mean, they, they say the word root. Uh, <laughs> but bigamy. Yeah, I guess five star. That is right. <laughs> Rushing it. She's kicking your ass, Andrew. Possible, yeah. <laughs> All right, Brie, what we got next? This Rochester loves to sit down almost as much as he loves to tell other people to sit down. <laughs> That's an accurate review. <laughs> I think this is impossible. Is that positive or negative? Five stars. It's five stars. Yeah, right? it's five stars. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. You ready? Yes. I want to reboot Jaws 2015, but it's just 202 minutes of me hunting down and killing Edward Rochester. Oh. One star? <laughs> Five stars. Oh, damn. That could have gone either way. That's just like, It wow. could have. <laughs> That's great. Wow. Gruesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a big laugh with this. LMAO, so much cringe. Oh boy, is this someone that enjoys cringe and would rate that five for the cringe? Or is this someone who is like genuinely like, oh, it was cringe, one star. Um, Five stars. It's a one star. You can never tell. It's true. All right, Kate, we got like four more left. All right. Hmm, I don't know. I feel like romance is like the tertiary thing going on here after misery porn and horror movie. (laughs) Uh, one star? That's right. Rushing Damn. it. Damn. All right. Um, <laughs> this is like not great choices left. No, not gonna lie. there's not. Um, so so much symbolism. <laughs> <laughs> so much. So much. Yeah. It. There. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of symbolism. <laughs> Wonder what being blind represents. <laughs> it's uh represents being blind. <laughs> Um, no, it, means, it represents Oedipus and fucking your mom, Andrew. God, have you ever read a book? I, so much symbol. Symbolism is good? <laughs> I don't know. Every single one of these has been one star. I've guessed five star like four times. One star. One star. Yes, good job, Andrew. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <clears throat> I expected Rochester to be more handsome, though. Okay. Wait, which adaptation is this? I think this is the William Hurt. Oh, oh, fair. <laughs> I mean, I don't like that version at all. I think that version's really Me neither. Boring. I could not finish it. It's, it's not good. It's lifeless. <laughs> this is a lifeless adaptation. 
Hmm. I just for my own principles because I don't like that adaptation. I'm just gonna say one star. That's a five stars. <laughs> They're like, oh damn, he's ugly. Five stars. <laughs> Andrew, if you get this right, you can tie it up. You can make this a tied game. Okay. This was a downer. <laughs> <laughs> It was a downer. It was a downer. <laughs> she, uh, Bree's symboling to me that it's five stars, I think. She wants me to get it. So, five stars. That's a tied game! Good job, everyone involved! Great job, I feel like Kate. I that cheated. Very you, you, hard you gave that one great. to me. <laughs> I said, this I mean, was a downer. Be... <laughs> Honestly, I think I would have I said five stars either way. That one's just... I, I, I like saying five stars. <laughs> Kate, did you have fun doing that? That was a lot of fun. Th those were some interesting awesome. reviews. <laughs> Letterbox is a cesspool of insane people. There wasn't as much kink shit this time. There's no one being like, I want to smell like Jane's farts or whatever the fuck we usually read. <laughs> you mean like from the Tarzan one that we just did? Yes, yes. Just like the Tarzan one we just did. Or the little Shop of Horrors one where it asked Awooga, whether the- Awooga, right? That one? <laughs> oh yeah, that one where they called Camilla Milf Awooga. <laughs> or the little shop of horrors where they said, "I wonder if the plant would eat me, eat my ass, poont out the butt hole." Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I forgot that. about that one. <laughs> Letterbox is full of insane people spitting out their kinks. You put them all in our attic. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Put Letterbox in the attic. <laughs> On that note, let. Uh -oh. <laughs> <He> just <laughs> left. <laughs> On oh. that note, bye. <laughs> Oh Did man, that's gonna suck <laughs> editing. Oh, he's I, back! I got relegated to the attic for a second. <laughs> uh, on what that happened? note, let's go into a mid show announcement! <laughs> Hey guys, sorry to interrupt in the middle of the show, but I've got a shill at you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Now over at Patreon, you get a weekly podcast that's only for the patrons. You get a ton of fun other stuff like me and Andrew doing commentaries of your favorite movies. And you can see our wonderful faces right now. And you can see Kate's face right now. Her, her lovely, lovely face. Oh my God, she's doing a backflip. She's swinging from the <laughs> ceiling. Oh my God, look at that. She's eating fire. How did you even do that? Oh, that, that's not appropriate. Don't do that kate uh, but you missed it all you can see it all on patreon though um our current patrons are melissa goldman terry needleman john donna leighton ackles danielle renix justice sampede ewan cassidy taskier uh monica throw mina maniri brent black Haley murray Nathaniel stacy coom joseph evans green carrie ahern mary lou showcat john van Ous, russ walker musical hell emily gracie tub lamb kyle summers jen ac Scoot in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Felice A, Liz Lim, Allison Stuller, Nothing is Certain Except Beth in Taxes, Thesbian, Ren Cullen, Wait in the Wings, Raphael, Martinez Salaz, Robert Benjamin, Jessica T, Mitchell Young, Chai Teacup, Katie McDonough, Timothy Keys, Jeffrey Machado, Chris Marcote, Tamimu Robinson, Kiji Marie Anastasio, Layla, RJ Norija, Sebastian Canino, Evan Regan, Lizzie Keynes, Charlie B, Patrick Deering, Courtney Shiner, Joe, yeah, that's a good one, Joe. Avery Brinson, Mary Lynn Brown, Mel Cormick, Lefemme Fictional, Bjorn Herman, Trenise Massey, August Gorman, Mac the Knife, Erica S., Zamai, and Toriana Vestal. They all support us at Patreon, and you should too. They get a lot of cool shit. Uh, you're missing out if you're not over there. So come join them over at Patreon. Also, our merch is on sale right now, and you can get our faces and stupid catchphrases on your body. Don't you want that? I know I do. All right, let's get back to the show. Let's do it.
think of the song between Jane and Helen, the forgiveness song, which I think is like the first recurring theme we're really introduced to in this? I thought it was all right. I mean, they do it at the beginning here. They bring it back at the death of uh, Miss Reed, right? Mm-hmm. Eh. It's decent. I kind of feel like they focus so heavily on the, the Rochester thing, and it doesn't tie into that at all. No, or... but that that's kind of in the book too where like the the school story feels like its own thing and then a new story begins when she's an adult i guess but i kind of like as a you know a musical you want it to be more cohesive but this one doesn't particularly feel that way but i like the song it sounds good i think most of the music in this sounds very yeah. nice and just for context it is the same gentleman that did the music for the pride and prejudice musical we covered last time kate was on i think this has a little bit of a better score <laughs> I I like the idea of bringing the song back. I think it would have worked better if they kept the original plot thread between her and the ant, of the ant seeking forgiveness um, instead of just kind of being mean to her towards the end and they just happen to run into each other. Yeah, I don't even understand how they met again. It's just like she just appears at her bedside. Yeah, it's like, what? It- it's just like she happens to be living with the cousin. It's like, what are the odds of that? <laughs> like, I guess her <laughs> actual offspring didn't want to take care of her anymore because, you know, she has a son and a daughter. Didn't he, like, die, like, of, like, well, she has, like, multiple in the book? kids. Uh, the, right. the eldest died, and then the other one became, like, destitute, and they ran up. Like, she didn't have money to give Jane. I think that's why they got rid of all the offspring because they basically get they wasted all her money. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I like the song. I like the idea of it because, like, Helen was just a very virtuous character in the book, so it makes sense for her to introduce the song and then for Jane to kind of understand that forgiveness when she meets her aunt again. Because even though it seems disconnected, Jane's uh, life as as an adult living with Rochester, she kind of is happier. She becomes her own person. She didn't have an individuality at the school. That's why she wanted to get out of there. They kind of try to zap it out of you. Uh, but it kind of fell flat a little bit just because they changed up how she meets the end again. Which is, yeah, fair. Um, yeah, I really like it with Helen. I feel mm. like it really kind of sells. If Helen was, like, maybe a child her own age, yes. maybe it was sold a little better, but, you yeah, know what? If you're reviving this, maybe maybe make a little change like that. Mm-hmm. Have the two girls alternate who sings the big song this night. <laughs> yeah. Um, let us talk a bit about... Um, we don't get Jane's I Want song until halfway through Act One, which is weird, and that's Sweet Liberty. It's nine o'clock in the morning. I teach what's been instilled in me. But is this all we're meant for? Condemned to mere tranquility. Well, women feel as men do. We must engage our minds and souls. Let us like our brothers. Let our worth define our roles Breaking custom and convention Let tradition give way For we all need our liberty For sweet liberty we pray And I wake from my bed With the urge to depart And to follow the dreams of my where she wants to be her own woman and go out and see the world and it's weird to not give that character any drive until most of the way through the first act well they were a child i guess i, I mean yeah I but you also have narrator version of her suit doing all the singing for her this is true <laughs> It is strange that they put it so because there's it's not like there's no songs at the school. No, there's tons of songs at the school, and I yeah. I like those songs too. I like the Children of God thing, but like none of them are actually uh, a Jane song focused. for her. Well, I mean, it comes late in the show, but I think it's a fine song, and it does I think describe it's beautiful. It describes what she wants at the very least. <laughs> 
I I liked the song. I think it should have if they had had a young Jane singing it. I think it would have been more fitting for child Jane to sing it, or at the very least, adult Jane narrating. Because it it does the like I said, the pacing is very weird. Because there's a lot of ground to cover from this book. But she knows pretty early on as a child that she wants to get the hell out of this school. <laughs> so I feel I... like she should have had that moment way earlier. What if I we would... gave it as a duet between Old Jane and Little Jane, kind of like fun home style? That would have been cool. I mean, I, I think that there's something where a lot of the songs in the school are the same song, and then this is kind of just the end of that song. Yeah. Like, they have the whole, like, oh, it's 7 a.m. or whatever thing. Yeah. I don't remember what she says. 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And, like, this is the end of that song, so it's almost like the entire thing is this is this song. Right. So you could argue that. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to say something here. It's like a if you if you say that, though, it's like this is a, a 20 minute prologue into the I want song. <laughs> Well, there's an argument you've made. Um, I think the song is fine. It's not even my favorite song for Jane. It's, it, it's the one where I feel like I get the least inside her head, especially compared to other songs we'll get to in a minute. Um, it's cute. It's a nice little introduction of, yay, we're leaving the school. Mm -hmm. I, I got my freedom. Um, but now we get like the I Am song that I think is probably one of my favorite in the show. Um, as good as you, um, Rochester's big... Here's my backstory and also why, what I stand for song where he explains how he ended up with Adele um, and why he's not like the big romantic. I held the world inside my hands, a man full in his prime. When she left me for another, pierced my heart a second time. Nothing lasts forever, she said. Find the door yourself, didn't want you. Think me still your flower. I've treasured every hour, it's true. But if I had loved you too, I might have been as good as you. I came upon her sometime later. The years had not been very kind. She had this child, Adele, said she was mine as well. Nothing lasts forever, Edward. Take good care and, oh yes, won't you? Take our lovely daughter. For you see, dear, I don't want her. But I'm still your flower. I'll just bloom elsewhere. Tell her my soul is in heaven with God. I think the song really works and is the first real humanizing moment for Rochester mm -hmm. in a way that I feel like I, I'm missing moments like this in other adaptations. I would agree with that. I think that was, I would say, one of the songs um, in this musical that perfectly encapsulated a lot of information, but in a very entertaining, digestible way. It's like what you need to know about his backstory, what he is as a person now, and, and it kind of, you start to understand why he's such a grumpy, sad person. Mm-hmm. But it also frames it as how much he respects Jane. The as good as you is like, I wish I was like you, which is also a sign of initial romance without being too on the nose, which I liked a lot too. I, I don't know. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll be honest. I don't really remember this song that well. <laughs> Um, it's the one where he explains like, oh, I had this girl and she was my flower and I loved her so much and then she left me. Then I saw her sometime later. She had this child, said it was mine. I, I, I don't think it was, but oh well, I took the kid anyways. So this is just him lying to her a bunch. <laughs> I don't think he's lying, no. no. <clears throat> no that... You don't think so? You don't think that that kid is the kid of the woman that he keeps locked in the attic? No, no, no. He doesn't, no, want, that is, he doesn't want to talk woman. about that? Yeah, so he doesn't want to woman. talk about that? Uh, no, so once his marriage, his initial marriage went in shambles, the reason why he, they don't really explain this part well, because Mrs. Fair, Mrs. Fairfax is the, the very, very funny older lady who's basically like Mrs. Potts mm -hmm. from Beauty and the Beast. Um, she explains yeah. it a bit more in depth in the book, but he's like never around. 
The only reason he ends up staying in the house as long as he does here is because he really likes Jane. And it's the first time he felt like he found like a friend at first and then eventually someone he wants to marry. He kind of just went all over Europe, just running away, partying, getting drunk. He meets this French woman who he can tell immediately she just hangs around him for money. Suddenly she shows up at his doorstep and be like, I had a kid, I think it's yours, <laughs> and then books it <laughs> and just dumps the kid on him. Damn, I guess I, yeah. they don't explain any of that, so I just kind of assumed that it was the woman's kid and he just didn't want to mention that that woman exists, so he just Which lies to everybody. Which is a fair connection fair, to yeah, make. <laughs> they do kind of gloss over, but no, it was another woman. It's very insinuated that he's very debaucherous, he just kind of partied a lot, got drunk to like, you know, waste away his sorrows, and then this woman happened to give him a kid, and Jane thinks of it as a good thing because very much... A common practice back then is basically what happened to Jane. You just dump them off at a school where they get abused. And he couldn't do it. He's like, I'm going to just hire a governess instead and at least give this girl a decent life. <laughs> you know, so. Mm -hmm. Which makes sense and shows why initially she respects him, even though he's kind of outwardly grumpy. Yes. Which he's not that grumpy in this musical. No. He's pretty kind, like up front, just kind of sarcastic. Yes. <laughs> He's much more, like, roguish and Gastoni than he is, like, actively abusive, which he, he pretty much is in the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the book is very much of the... I guess all I gotta say is um, Stephanie Meyer based the name Edward from Edward Rochester, and I think that a lot of that character bleeds through. So take that for what it's worth. Um, all Oof. right, let's take a look. Sirens, which is the big, I, 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 I love Jane and I love Rochester. This is End a good of one. act one. I love this song. God save him if he can be saved. Free him if his soul's enslaved. Clear the clouded refuge of his mind. Quell his anger, calm his scorn. Let his spirit be reborn. Help him gather sight where he is blind. For Don't I believe. This is my favorite song, I think, in the in the show. I do not blame you at all. Um, it's the one they sang for the Tonys. It's the one they sang for all the performances. It is the calling song. It is the perfect end act one. I wish there was a little bit more of a cliffhanger than, oh, Bertha's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a little awkward. She kind of looked like a like a, a little goblin villain just kind of hanging off in the shadows like, oh, but I'm still here. <laughs> Um, once again, this is like the one I think about the most when I talk about like the blind references because it's in both the choruses because yeah. she's like, help him gather sight where he is blind. And she says, um, where I won't hear her voice, where I am blind and free, <laughs> like right next to each other, like this, overlapping. What do you have against foreshadowing? Okay, <laughs> this is excellent, excellent stuff. <laughs> the most important part of the story is when he's blind. <laughs> That's the Pardon. point. A st element of the story is so important you didn't even know it. <laughs> all all roads lead to blindness. Okay. Find Oedipus Rex. <laughs> uh, what did no, you think I, of the song? I, I didn't even I didn't even realize the blindness thing happened, and they foreshadowed it like a million times. <laughs> Honestly, I, I had the opposite effect mostly because I knew he was going to get blind. I didn't even catch the foreshadowing. I was just sort of enjoying the emotions <laughs> conveying through the song. I didn't even pick up on the heavy foreshadowing. So, which I guess speaks I'm going to bring it moment. up every time. Every time it happens. We're going to go through a couple more songs where it literally it's like, I will read you the lyrics. <laughs> um, but this one's like very good. They set up like his lyrics, her lyrics, and then they sing it at the same time. It feels very intense, very dark, romancy in a way that a lot of other musicals can't seem to get yeah. right. <laughs> like especially Rebecca. Like this feels like it matches the tension and the dark seduction that this is trying to do. Mm -hmm. No, I would definitely agree with that. And it's also a great moment in the book because that's the tipping point in their relationship mm -hmm. where Rogers was like, oh, I can trust you. You know, like you are willing to do something for me. Like you saved, you literally saved my life. I was about to die mm -hmm. in a burning bed. Um, so that's like where they're both like, hey, with all this adrenaline going, I think I might have feelings for you. You know, like I was willing to save you. And, and I think that 
the song perfectly complements and enhances that moment and makes it like even more romantic mm-hmm. than it was in the book. And we're and it, it I agree. Um, I do want to say that does follow the pledge, which is the moment where he's like, what would you do if everyone just started hating on me real hardcore? And what would you do if I got canceled on Twitter? She's like, I would never lose faith on you. Oh my God, that would be well, yeah, a lot of retelling. What would you do if I got canceled on Twitter? <laughs> For having a wife in the back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh... I would stand by you. <laughs> uh, I... So the song, this is one of their changes that they kind of did, the way that they had a Russian mason. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a lot more tense in the book and in other adaptations. The song was good. It was just, again, the segue into it was a little clunky because at this point in the book, like Rochester and Jane are getting along very well, but now Jane is feeling confused because Blanche Ingram's there and all that stuff. And Mm -hmm. he's being very mischievous, he's being very jovial, and then the minute he sees Mason, he grabs onto Jane, I believe, in the book, and he just kind of whispers to her, and she's just very, very confused. She's like, uh, no, uh, I, I wouldn't let these people hurt you. And I like that they used it for a song because it is a very tense moment where Jane realizes, oh, this weird shit that keeps happening in this house, I don't think I'm imagining it. (laughs) I think something's really wrong here. Um... I, just the segue into it was a little rush, but I liked the initial song. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense. I want to talk about another song m- very briefly because I talked about it a little earlier, and that's Painting Her Portrait, which is a, b- one of my favorite pieces in the book where Jane literally is using her artistic talents to hurt herself, where she's like, I'm going to draw how beautiful this woman is and then draw myself and compare how ugly I am to her. Um, why would he ever want me when he could have this? Mm-hmm. It is like something that you can never really do in a film adaptation, but in a musical, you can really, really do that. And it's so good here. I really, really like this song. Now my painting is done. I'll start another, this one of her And when I close my eyes, I clearly see her face Capture her grace and poise, fight back the tears And I'm painting her portrait, an absolute likeness The loveliest face, the most delicate skin A tribute to beauty Perfect Miss Ingram Omit neither diamond ring Nor golden rose Make her a lady of rank Glistening satin Oh, how she glows Mix in your finest tints Paint her dramatically With all your sweetest hues Sit here fanatically Painting up got to show how well the emotional abuse that she's being subjected to is working. I mean, yeah, but she also calls herself a poor blind puppy, so blind. Well, that's, I mean, <laughs> foreshadowing. <laughs> um, what did you think, Kate? I, I actually really really like the song, too, and you're right. You Not a lot of adaptations really cover the way Jane usually expresses herself is through drawing and painting. Mm-hmm. There's like a few adaptations where like Rochester will accuse her of plagiarism and she gets really pissed. But that's, I mean, you know, like where he's like, oh, you must have copied that off of something. She's like, no. And then they have an argument. Here instead they use it as like a, a great emotional piece of I can't rectify that I'm falling in love with this man who I think is too good for me or I'm too wretched for him, vice versa. And then, you know, Blanche makes everything worse because not only mm-hmm. is she prettier and richer, she's just... She's just an utter bitch. <laughs> you know, she's just, just, I, oh, can I say, the actress who's playing her did it really, really well. I hated her in the in the nicest <laughs> way possible. I mean that, like, she really oozed that, like, oh, this girl, oh. And her songs are, like, the right kind of obnoxious where it's not unpleasant to listen yes. to, but you are annoyed by the character. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, I will say, like, um, the, the maid, I forget it, the name is Fairfax. Yes, um, Mrs. Fairfax. Her songs do tend to get a little grating, but not much. No, I, I would say she's a pretty accurate representation of her. I, I would say she's nicer than Fairfax in the book. Like, she's she comes around on Jane and Rochester getting married, but I, I don't know. She kind of just reminded me of, like, an Angela Lansbury-style Mrs. Potts, so I was kind of endeared to her. There's just something very kooky about her. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, I like it. It's ambivalently absent-minded in a cute way. Yeah. I think it is an effective choice. Um, let's move on to the proposal scene, which once again, turns literal book dialogue into song poetry very perfectly. I want to read a portion of the book really quick um, where he's like describing it. I'm afraid the cord of communication will be snapped and that I'm nervous of the notion that I should take to bleeding inwardly as you'd forget me. And that is beautifully turned into lyrics um, right here where he's like, I'm afraid that many a mile would sever the tie and I would take to bleeding inwardly using literally the same phrasing but making it rhyme. It is so good. Um, as well, he, he says, uh, I wash my hands of every youthful cry, defy them all, and God will give me time, and you will lead me blind! <laughs> he did it! <laughs> what does it mean? What, like, symbolically, what does the blindness mean? Um, Kate, <laughs> I'll def- de The song's good. I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, this is my favorite song, I think, in the entire musical. This is also my favorite scene mm -hmm. in the book as well, the proposal scene. I agree. Uh, where they really let it all out, and I really did love how they married the, married the lines from the book and with the lyrics of the song and then making sure everything rhymed. I thought it worked really, really, really well, and I really think they captured all of that raw emotion because... I mean, in, in the, the book, it's more of like an argument turned love confession because she's pissed that he pranked her. But I, I like that they kind of softened that because that's not really why you want to see the proposal. Like, it's them being vulnerable to each other and really finally mm -hmm. just like, all right, no, we're cutting the bullshit. This is how we actually feel about each other. Um, and I really, really like this song a lot. I think this one was my favorite. Yeah, I agree. And it's probably my favorite proposal scene of any version of Jane Eyre because it starts like a little bit jokier and then it like it turns serious. And a lot of the times where it, it feels surprising the things that she com comes out of her mouth, like when she's like, I'm afraid it would make it as hard to be leave me as it is for me to leave you and then her catching that and then the music like guiding her into like backtracking mm -hmm. like little moments like that are so great um it is very very effective in a way that like spoken dialogue in a film just usually isn't let us move on um <laughs> we talked about farewell fair angel a lot earlier we're gonna skip over that one however let us talk about the blind talk in that song really quick so this is the the why is there so much? I, I wonder why. Um so why must I have eyes to see you're not there? Um, you know, it said a lot. Um, yeah, that is like a recurring thing. That is the chorus. Why must I have eyes to see she's not there? That is said three times in the song. <laughs> and the next time we see him, he is blind. Um, it's uh it's all symbolic. You know, it represents being blind. This has 11 o'clock number vibes to it, too, which there's, like, five songs afterward. There, there was no proper 11 o'clock number, I guess. I think that they should have just had that. Just get rid of the rest of, like, the cousins or whatever. Who cares about all that? <laughs> I w Honestly. I, I agree with that, but here I am going to talk again about uh, The Voice Across the Moors, which is um, the John River song where he's like, you should be a missionary with me, Jane. <laughs> The way it ends is one element from the book that has never, ever worked in any film adaptation, but works so well here. So Jane is like, just fuck it around, doing whatever she's doing in different adaptations. It depends. And then she just hears the voice of Edward say Jane. Like, and it's like, Jane, Jane, like an Obi-Wan <laughs> voice. It is never effective. It has never worked. However, 
having it sung in a falsetto like this and slowly grow louder and louder, very, very effective because of that. Because it's sung, because you're allowed to kind of step back and let it be a musical. Because that is like the one weirdly supernatural thing that happens in the book because mm-hmm. everything else is fairly grounded. And then she's like, I heard you. And then I said your name. And then he's like, I said your name and I heard you call it back. <laughs> um. So that magical realism works for me as a climax to a musical. No, I would definitely agree with that. I I agree. Uh, There's not a lot of supernatural in the book. Like there's a mentions of like, oh, there might be ghosts. And then not really, (laughs) you know, nothing's really brought up, especially because she realizes the woman in the attic is not a ghost. It's an actual woman trapped in an attic. So when that happens uh where jane hears his voice and she's like oh my god i'm coming you know like she just believes that she hears his voice in the wind even though nothing else supernatural has ever actually happened to her works way better in a musical because you kind of it lends more into the magic of song where you're like all right i Mm. I buy that he just she could just hear him now you know it it works in the because she's trying to drum up passion and like yeah i'm okay with marrying my cousin and then she hears his voice like maybe i'm not (laughs) and then you know runs (laughs) off (laughs) Yes, this is what is supposed to be like the climax of the story and it never lands in a film and it's part of the reason why I think this is the best version. So, my wonderful friends, what is our overall thoughts on Jane Eyre the musical and our cheese rating? Um, Kate, do you want to go first? It's not your first rodeo. I I would compare it to this cheese I had once from Trader Joe's, which is, I believe it's a, what looks like a normal cheddar, but it has hints of cinnamon inside it. So while it's not my favorite cheese ever, I kind of like the little surprises that I do get with it, where I'm like, oh, I really enjoyed this bite. Oh, I also enjoyed this. Mm, didn't really enjoy this one. Um, and that's what I, I would give it overall. Like it has some it has a good idea. Maybe the execution didn't always land for me, but overall, I didn't regret watching it. I enjoyed the time that I had with it. You know what? That's that's a fair enough explanation. Um, I completely understand that. Andrew, what about you? I thought that the whole thing was pretty good, and the music is what kind of held the entire thing together, uh, for the most part. Um, although I kind of wish the plot was a little more clear, because I had to watch it twice just to even understand what happened. <laughs> um, and honestly, there's still some stuff that I feel like just wasn't explained, like how she found her aunt, or how she got the job at the house that she went to after she left the school, which I feel like was just completely glossed over. She just showed up. But either way, I'm going to give it a Rochester cheese, which is not from Rochester, New York, but from Spring Valley, Minnesota, which is a little weird, but we'll go with that. <laughs> you know what? That's fair. Um, Bree, what do you think of our discussion, your cheese rating of that? This was a fantastic discussion. Um, I really enjoyed the letterbox segment this week. Um, I guess Rochester should have been more sexy. <laughs> Uh, that's kind of what I'm getting from that. My cheese this week is a plain, ch- uh, plain Jane, uh, and it Ooh. is a mature Scottish cheddar. And I don't know, seems fitting to me. I can't fight that. Um, I am just going to go with basic cheddar cheese as churned on the Thornfield Acres farm in Rochester, Washington. Oh, it's he, Rochester. Did the thing. he did the thing. It's Rochester and Thornfield. How can I not? You know what? On that note, Kate, you've got a wonderful amount of content out there. Promote it for the world. Of course. I have a channel on YouTube called That Movie Chick. I also Twitch every weekday uh, under the name Kate the Movie Chick. Uh, So you can always see me there. Uh, If you just want to follow along for my random thoughts, I am also on Twitter. I think it's underscore that movie chick. (laughs) It's a great Twitter. A lot of great thoughts. Um, I, I love following it. Um, I, I really, really enjoy your Xena recap. <laughs> um, that was a lot of fun to watch. Um, I feel like you and... said that last time. It's, it's still good. It's still Does going. it make it bad? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of seasons to cover. It, it's not like it was one video. There's like a couple. <laughs> it's true. Hey, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, obviously you're not watching. <laughs> you don't keep up with the Xena. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know who should definitely <laughs> keep up with Xena? Our, Our wonderful patrons. patrons. <laughs> Thank you guys for listening. We're on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Musicals with Cheese. We're on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals, Patreon Musicals with Cheese, Instagram Musicals with Cheese, YouTube page Musicals with Cheese. We have a patron-only podcast, Patreon with Cheese, where we cover TV shows. 
We're currently doing Encore, which is a lot of fun with our good friend Adam Walker. Email us at musicaltheaterlives at gmail.com. Our title card was created by the amazing Jolene Casco. Send her some love on Instagram at Jolene Casco. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. Um, shoot them some love on Twitter. They're great. This show is produced by the wonderful, the incredible, the beautiful, my good, good friend, Brianna Jones. Thank you for keeping the show afloat. I love you so much. Um, our preview segment is probably one of my most favorite things in the world. <laughs> um, our themes were created by Robin Nash of IOU Music UK. Go send them some love, please. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform, even though our Rochester is just too ugly. <laughs> All right, you guys. Is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this up? Oh, you know, I, I really wish I could recreate Jaws and hunt down the Rochester who wasn't sexy enough for me. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> on that note, we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. Oh, I could sail away, get lost at sea where I won't hear a voice where I'll be blind and free. For sirens call the sailors, he calls to me.